Well, we're live. We're live. Um, and we're going to do everything Jehovah Witnessism. Hi, I'm Dr. Jason W. Morrison, theologist, New South Wales, Australia. And um, I'm here to answer, if I can, not that the XJW community need my help, any questions that you might think or put out there regarding Jehovah Witnessism and its horrible, lethal, cult ways. <clears throat> Now, I don't know if anybody's going to jump on here or what's going to happen. I've just got a spare bit of time. There's somebody there. Let's see if we can find out who that is. If you're there, feel free to chat. Um, don't hold back. Let's get this thing broken wide open. Uh, you know, they want me to say something. Denise. Oh, hello, Denise. How are you, how are you feeling? How are you going? Um, I noticed your last video was a lot clearer. You've come out of the dark. Maybe that's a new light, but it's lovely to see you. Um, you're an expert on Jehovah Witnesses, probably way more than what I am being an ex-Jehovah Witness yourself. Um, I'm just putting it out there to try and learn more as a professional theologist. I'm in the way of where you guys might be thinking at the moment or what, what might be going on in Australia. The latest thing is they've named and shamed along with another 100 organisations um, the Jehovah Witnesses for, for lagging on their commitment to the sexual abuse uh, regest screen. They've dodged that bullet as best as they can, but they're not the only ones, but they're the ones I've been focusing on. Um, but, gee, they're coming to, they're falling to bits, aren't they, the Jehovah Witnesses lately? It's just been all bad news for them. I don't think they've got any good news. The poor deceived um, believers in Russia... Imagine going to jail for a lie because you believe in a lie. Oh, my gosh. Oh, God. Oh, I don't, oh, yeah, here we go. And if we confess our sins, Denise, you know, if we're just transparent about our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us all unrighteousness. 1 John 1. Seven and eight, I think, or somewhere around that area. So I can't see what their fear is and why they don't want to admit their mistakes. I think John Cedars, John Cedars even said if they just come out and admitted their mistakes, there'd be a little bit of damage control, but the organisation would go on because that's just human. That's just predictably predictable for human. Humans want to cling on to some things. When I was coming back from kiteboarding today, I was thinking about it, you know. There's a nature inside us that even if we know we're doing something wrong or we're in something that's wrong, sometimes that can be a, a, attractive to our sinful nature, to a part of our nature. And therefore, it's very hard to find a way out of our connection to the thing that's leading us into wrong. There is something in our nature, particularly if there's rules and regulations attached to that, that makes us makes it very difficult for us to get out. Now, Denise has said, admitting guilt is always hard for humans, and it is. It is. Um, <clears throat> when my wife left, going back 20 years, my first wife, um, I had to admit to her that I'd made some mistakes. Now, there was two ways I could have gone. I could have gone the nasty path and gone, it's all your fault, blah, 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 and learnt nothing about myself. Or I could go the other way and say, okay, I've made some very serious mistakes. This is why you've left. I admit that. I want to learn about myself so I don't make those mistakes anymore and I want to protect my children from any of my resentment and bitterness that I may have as a result of you leaving the marriage. And so that's the way I went. Um, because I believed in 1 John 7, whatever, what, 1 John 1, in, I think it's verse 7, forgive me if it's not, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's very hard, Denise, it is for humans, for all of us to admit when we're wrong. Um, 
and sometimes usually we can be wrong when we judge. Uh, we can we can muddle things up if we judge too hard. But what the difficulty for me is as um, you know, an okay theologian or theologist is that um, <clears throat> it's it's there for everyone to see the lies and the betrayal and the deceit and the shunning and everything else is there for everyone to see. And so what I find difficult for the, and difficult is, is my empathy for the pe people that are in that. I did my exercise this morning, cycling and paddling the sup and walking. Um, and the Jehovah Witnesses were at the station now, I would have loved to have gone up to them and said, look, you're, you're deceived and people might like me know that and you're embarrassing yourselves. In fact, I would have loved to have gone up to them and said, you really need to leave because you're a danger to the community. I don't think they should be allowed in the community. Now, that's not an attack against the people themselves. They're devoted and committed and they, they really sink their hearts into it. But they're taking the wrong thing to the public, and that's what's dangerous. The poor, naive people that are struggling. It's very expensive to live in Australia, and the people that go to the station travel from Gosford to Sydney um, because there's more money in Sydney, and it's only about an hour and 20 minutes trip to Sydney from Gosford. And so you've got a large populace in our area that travel um, from the central coast down to Sydney and back again each day. I used to do it as a, when I was a bricklayer and it's very, very hard. You, walk, you travel an hour and a half down, you work all day, you travel an hour and a half back and you do it and do it. In the end, I said, I can't do this anymore. It's not worth it. But how do you get to the place? You know what I've learned and, and seen this many, many times. It usually takes, um, Denise, severe pain and loss severe pain and loss before somebody actually comes to the place where they humble themselves and say, I've made a mistake. I have done something wrong. Will you help me fix it? Lord or whoever else they cry out to. One of the th problems with Jehovah Witnessism is once you begin to believe a lie, then you start to betray your conscience you begin to undermine your own conscience. And this is where we lose the capability and the humility to be able to confront things on an honest level. So Jehovah Witnessism, and I call it Jehovah Witnessism now, just like Buddhism or any other um, Satanism, um, it's an ism and it's very sad for the people that are still in it. And I do want to empathize with those like yourself, Denise, and um, there's another gentleman, the runaway slave was in it for 40 years, um, the Dutchman logger, and, oh, there's so many people that their whole life was in it. Um, <clears throat> what does it take? What does it take for you to finally come to that place where you're going, I'm going to lose a lot here, I'm going to lose the lot, but I've got to get out, I can't take it anymore. I wonder... You know, look, to be honest with you, that's what happened to me in the in the first church I was in. Um, I was an evangelist. We went out on the street, my first wife and I, and for many, many years and until we had um, two children and she never came anymore. But I went out there for about 10 years and it turned into a big event um, on a New Year's night. One of the businessmen jumped on board and it turned onto a into a great big event with fireworks and the new year and all this stuff. And many, many people come to the Lord. But what happened was it started a revival in the church. And what I mean by that is there were people trickling in and then all of a sudden large numbers of people started to come to the church to the point where we couldn't fit them into the church hall, to the school hall where we would meet. And I remember the pastor turning to me one day and saying, help these people when they come in and I said pastor we've got them here you need to trust people now to help these people integrate and feel welcome into the church and he didn't know how to do it he, he didn't trust the people that were working for him enough now I find <clears throat> the 
the Jehovah Witnesses the opposite to this. They seem, and tell me if I've got it wrong, they seem to be able to send anybody out onto the out, out to help people and stuff. I don't know if that's correct, but what happened was our pastor didn't trust people enough to duplicate and delegate people into positions where he could help the ones that were coming in. But what I find is with the Jehovah Witnesses, there's so many of them down here on the waterfront, surely. Um, do the publishers that go out, do they help with new people that come in or is there an organisation structure in there or what? So what I'm trying to say is by the end of it all, I, I didn't want to take people to my church because it wasn't coping with um, the discipleship part of it, which is duplication and trust and and re you know sending people back out again once they'd been trained in the things of Christ. Uh, do, another question for me is: Do the Jehovah Witnesses have a foundation course uh, similar to the outline of Hebrews chapter six, where it asks you to learn the um, to lay a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God and the doctrine of baptisms and all this sort of stuff. Do the Jehovah Witnesses um, <clears throat> get taught specifically those things or do they have to just go along with the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society publications? Um, I was one of these people that when I got saved, I wanted to find out what the truth was. So I launched my because my granddad was a baptist and he went to have his bible study every thursday night but my grandmother never went um she'd been hurt by a church earlier in her life a baptist church i believe and she said that's it she didn't let her faithfulness and loyalty which is what religion religious organizations grab hold of your faithfulness and loyalty and they harness that in a way that makes you, as Denise used the word guilt, makes you question whether your decisions for yourself are integral or not. Because what they teach is you need to put, this is where a lot of people get caught in religions, they tell you that you need to put Jehovah first. Now that's that could grab anybody at the start if you don't know your Bible well enough. But once you realise that you can't love the Lord your God with all your mind and heart and soul and all this other stuff, then you begin to understand that a lot of the things that these religious organisations are asking are impossible. Now, Denise has said, anyone need to have the whole story to decide what to do that is right? The JWs have to have full trust in the org, which is not in line with the Bible. If all it all hangs on trust in the org, yeah, gee whiz, what a what a powerful, influential um, organisation that is, and what a um, they know what they're doing. Those governing body members, they know that they're lying. Um, Angus Stewart, in an interview, uh, well after the Australian Royal Commission in a private interview on one of the XJW channels. It was audible. It was an audio interview. And I think he was in on his dairy farm in South Africa or somewhere like that. He said that um, behind the scenes, um, the commissioner and Angus had come to the conclusion, and you might be able to confirm this, Denise, that the Jehovah Witnesses had been... The, the big important ones that were going to these, um, the court, the court in the um, Australian Royal Commission, didn't know to believe anything else. They actually believed what they were saying. Um, and I found that a little bit bizarre, but it, it must be true. They'd come to the conclusion that it wasn't going to matter what you said to these men or how you explained it, they believed even to their death, that what the Jehovah Witness teachings were teaching were true. I heard that interview. He was sick over what they believed. <laughs> oh, yes, I know, I know. <clears throat> oh, my gosh. It's, it's astounding um, 
as I said before, I sunk myself straight into university. It cost me tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of words in essays. And I'm, I'm in the middle of a PhD at the moment. And I think I've still got like 150,000 words worth of essays before I start the 75,000 word book. I've got to write a book to get the PhD. And you don't get past anything with that stuff. And that's what teaches you to critically think correctly. And it's hard. It's, it's really hard. But at the end of it, um, you get qualified when the government and the, the university believe that what your um, beliefs are, are, are sound. Now, to cut all that down to the nitty gritty, really, what the gospel, the good news of the gospel is that the finished work of Christ has made all our issues with Jehovah and God, or whatever you want to call him respectfully, he has settled those for time and eternity. It is sad, says Denise, such a waste when following Christ is so much easier and true, for real. The thing about following Jesus is, and this is where we all struggle, it's so simple, we don't get it. We don't realise that for time and eternity, the finished work of Christ has resolved all our issues between, let me put it this way, deity and humanity, never to worry again. What people don't think about is how can we involuntarily be born into sin and then have to pay the price for that, right? This is what religion will teach you and try and dodge the bullets of that involuntarily put there. But if you read Hebrews and Romans 5, specifically very, very carefully, it shows us that when Jesus died on the cross, we involuntarily were moved from this position of what Adam put us in, of sin. We were moved involuntarily into righteousness. Now, that teaches me that we um, don't need to be getting in it's a matter of whether you want it or not. It's a matter of whether you want to get out or not. Now, what I've found in a lot of Pentecostal churches is they'll ask you to come to the altar if you want to receive. But you've already got it. It's something that you already have. I think what they should be saying is if you don't want it, can you put your hand up and we'll help explain you how to have it or what you've already got. You've won the lottery. You've just got to hand your ticket in. It's yours. Now, Denise says, a fine example of the grace of God. We drop to our knees from overwhelming love, and we do. One of the difficult things about um, religion and Christianity is the freedom. And I've said many times that freedom, if you're not sure if you're free, look at it like this. Freedom, in any use of the word, is measured by how far you can live and how much adventure you want to have or whatever it is up until the point where you start to hurt yourself or somebody else. Once you start to hurt yourself or somebody else, you've moved out of freedom. So in other words, you can do whatever you like as long as you're not harming yourself or anybody else, which is what causes us to get in trouble. Now, Denise says, no one knows freedom like a former slave. <laughs> It must have been horrible. It must have been absolutely horrible, really, honestly. <clears throat> I've gone down the waterfront to try and speak to these people and, gee, they, they don't want to talk. I don't think they even want to be there, you know. Um, <clears throat> they don't want to talk. They don't, they don't want to answer questions. I, I don't know what it must have been like. When I was an evangelist down here, um, I was talking earlier, I used to get up on the bench and, and preach. I don't think anybody wanted to listen to me or, or and, and all that. I think I was just trying to impress Jehovah, which was something I didn't need to do. But the thing is, Jesus said a new commandment I give to you to love your neighbour as yourself. Well, that's hard enough. Honestly, it is. It's, it's so hard. Um, my neighbour come to the door. This is a personal example. Just last week, you come to the door and I was on the toilet. And he sang out, Jace, are you there, Jace? I said, who is it? He goes, Shane. I said, what do you want? And he goes, oh, stuff you. And he's gone off. He got offended. But I was on the toilet. So I went out and I said, Shane, are you all right? He goes, you don't speak to me like that. Come on, I'll 
come out the front and I'll have you on. And I've gone, Shane, you've misunderstood, mate. I was sitting on the toilet, um, you know what, and um, I didn't know what was going on because we've got security and everything at, at the front of our place. Oh, he got offended. I said, no, no, we can't fight like this. So I went over there and fixed it up. But my goodness me, you know, trying to love your neighbour, there's so many dynamics to humans, including, you know, I've got dynamics. Some One minute me and the missus can be going well. The next minute it's like it's hanging by a thread. Oh, gosh, you know, you know how it is. It's It's not easy. So... We need one of the things lately that I've been trying to teach my kids is the recalibration of your mind, leaving your mind alone so that when you sleep, it can recalibrate itself to take on the next day. We've lost the value of that. The fact that our mind will compartmentalize and recalibrate itself so that when we wake up the next day, we accomplish what we're supposed to accomplish as best as we can. And with freedom, what that means is if you consciously try to think the Holy Spirit into helping you, which is what a lot of religions teach, if you constantly try and think the Holy Spirit into helping you, you're actually interfering. You're better off just getting out there and doing what you've got to do and know that somehow, even if you're not conscious of it, the Holy Spirit is there helping you. That's how it works. Denise says a friend of mine that is still on the inside oh gosh says that 40 percent of his congregation is waking or awake yes um and it's due to the internet isn't it the blessing of the internet what an awesome instrument for anybody that just wants to use and and harness the sources of of and the knowledge i mean it doesn't mean you believe everything. That's what exercising your mind is, isn't it? Hebrews chapter 6. Um, I'm sure it's Hebrews chapter 6 that we have to exercise our senses to be able to discern both good and evil, isn't it? Um, and if you're not testing the things that you're listening to, then you're not exercising your senses, are you? You're just allowing yourself to become numb and, and unequipped. Now, Denise says, if they, are all, if they all just walked away, no one left to shun them, they are afraid of the consequences of men. You know, <clears throat> just want to say, when I left the church I was in and um, pioneered another church, um, I never, never took anybody from the church with me or anything like that, left well, that church right, my wife's mother stayed at the church. This is very personal, but I'll share it. She stayed at that church. Didn't want her to come, to be honest with you, so I didn't want to upset the pastor. They worked on my wife until she left. Now, I hear a lot of this in the Jehovah Witnesses. Um, somebody wakes up and the man wants to leave or the wife wants to leave and then the partner stays and it dissolves the marriage. It's the undermining of the organisation, of the people in that organisation, because what they start to say is, oh, that person's not putting Jehovah first, he's this and that and all the other. But it's not that at all. It could be a personal crisis. It could be a personal awakening. Um, they could have fallen out of something inside the organisation that they didn't agree with. But what it will do, it will put its claws into the marriage and pull it apart using the religion as the means to justify the defragmentation or the fragmentation and disintegration of what was a healthy marriage. I've seen it and experienced it with my own two eyes. Now, the Jehovah Witnesses take that to a whole other level because they say it's a form of Jehovah disciplining you. When I was a young, when I was a young bloke, I was a larrikin. I mean, we had our push bikes. We'd be playing cricket on the front lawn. We'd be building billy carts and we'd be, you know, giving all the parents the willies. They'd be telling us to get off the streets. And I remember one day I broke my bike chain and I twirled it and I threw it, went to throw it across to the bacon lot and it tangled around the electrical lines and it blew up the transformer at the end of the street. I thought the world was going to end. Um, oh, gee, I thought I was going to get in trouble and the police came and everything, but they let me off. We were larrikins. Um, Denise says... There is no consequences from God for leaving, just an organisation. 
<laughs> they are made to believe there is. There are no, look, honestly, as I've said, they get us to the, this consciousness of thinking that God's taking notice of all that we do. Honestly, that's the biggest hope. He's taking, he's taken, taken past tense. Notice of what Jesus has done. Now, what Jesus, look, when I turn up, however that's going to happen, and have to front up and give an account, I'm just going to say, look, i got nothing. I have got nothing except a sinful nature which I didn't ask for. But what I have got is I believed in what Christ did. Now, other than that, I'm just going to get out and live and I'm not going to hurt myself or anybody else. But that's all I've got, Lord, or whoever I have to front up to. And it's all we've all got. An organisation is like a train. And if you don't want to be on that train and you get off at the next platform, guess what's going to happen? That train's going to go on without you and you're not going to be missed. That's the shunning mentality. Look to Jehovah and forget about the people that are important. Disconnect your valuable senses, your loving senses from the people that matter, which is what Jesus actually said to do, to love your neighbour as yourself. And point them towards Jehovah and waste them all on Jehovah and spend all that stuff on Jehovah and forget about the value of the people that you're supposed to be caring about. That's how religion deceives us. So um, I've got to put the chicken on and she's got the missus has put on, you know, I've got to put it in the oven. I'm going to put on, she's got chicken with some sauce and tomato and onion and she gets home at about 6 o'clock. And I'm going to put that on for her. I tell you what, Denise, I look forward to your next video. You've been a wonderful ambassador for the XJW community. You've been a wonderful source of um, statistics on those videos that you bring on your statistics. I love your presentation and your, your mannerism. Is, is just, you're just a humble, beautiful lady. I want to acknowledge you and commend you. I do look forward to your next presentation whenever that might be i hope your health is well and anybody else listening i hope your health is well put your health first and um thank you for watching and denise is just saying i like your channel too you explain things well well i do i'm not perfect um anything that you don't agree with throw out um just throw it out um it doesn't you know take what's good and Forget about what's bad, but I do try and keep it simple. My my main thrust, if I'm being when I used to be a chaplain in the hospital system, and didn't the Jehovah Witnesses make a nuisance of themselves in the hospital system? My goodness, they got no idea how unwelcome they are. But nevertheless, um, my treatise is there is nothing we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad because the finished work of Christ has settled and resolved all our issues with God and Jehovah or whoever else for time and eternity. Thank you, Denise. God bless you. God bless the other watchers and listeners. This is Dr. Jason W. Morrison, New South Wales, Australia. Bye for now.